I'm going to be talking about CT and where it fits in our uh, assessment of patients uh, going for uh, TAVR procedures. And of course, some of the important issues that we want to bring up when we do TAVRs are determining suitable vascular access. So we want to know vessel size, minimal luminal diameter, circumferential calcification and extent, and vessel tortuosity. To ensure safety, we want to know AV leaflet, AV valve leaflet length, calcification, severity of AI, location of the coronary ostea so we don't occlude them, aortic uh, root annulation, uh, LVOT calcification, which we'll talk a little bit about, ascending uh, thoracic aortic dimension, septal thickness, and uh, we also want to measure the aortic annulus to define uh, what kind of valve to put in, and that's the diameter, the perimeter, or the area, and we want to know the severity of annulus calcification. So as you've already seen, these are some of the more, uh, well, utilized valves, the uh, core valve and the sapien valve. The uh, core valve, as you know, is self-expanding. It has some anatomic uh, exclusions in terms of uh, vascular issues as well as uh, cardiac issues in terms of uh, the major trials that have been published. But, uh, and generally speaking, all of these issues can be assessed in terms of the aortic annulus and the size and the dimension uh, using CT. There's also the sapien valve, which uh, obviously the femoral approach it's, it's, uh, can be delivered, and there are vac vascular access issues there too in terms of what the optimal or appropriate uh, vascular size is to deliver the device. And that also goes for not only the sapien, original sapien, but the sapien XT valve as well. And uh, of course, very important to this particular valve is the annulus to carnary osteal height, uh, which is not an issue with the, with the core valve. The sapien valves are shown here. This is the original sapien valves. These are the XT valves, which go up to 29 millimeters now. This is how these valves look. You can see the um, expandable valves, uh, the core valve over here, and you can see the coronary osteum or spare. You can see over here the, the sapien valve where you really need to worry about the coronary osteum. You can see how these valves are quite different in terms of, of how to approach uh, placement and how CT might be helpful in both, uh, uh, both uh, timing and, and characterization of how to use these valves. Now with CT, first of all, let's talk about access. Generally speaking, uh, with CT, we want to do the entire body. We want to know what the aorta looks like. We want to know what the distal arteries look like. And we can use several different protocols. We could simply scan the entire patient using a very high uh, radiation protocol. We could do two separate studies, which, of course, would increase contrast. But what we do for TAVR studies is one single scan. We do a cardiac scan, which is shown here. And then we flash the entire body which with a very low radiation scan to see what the access vessels look like. This, an ex this just shows us uh, how the, um, how the uh, system works. And uh, I think, um, am, I, am I missing a, um, whoops. You can see on the, on the right that the, uh, the high flash mode is a very fast uh, modality. And uh, that's what we typically use for our TAVR patients, whereas on the left-hand side is a standard uh, helical scan, which is, ex which is extremely slow. Now, in terms of um, uh, how this looks, uh, this is uh, just one of our patients that we're just kind of peeling down to the uh, aortic iliac vessels. Uh, we get isotropic 3D rendered images for peripheral vasculature. You can see we can do all the measurements very carefully in, in different planes to look at the iliacs and, and the, and the uh, femoral arteries. And we can also look at the uh, abdominal aorta as well. This patient had a little abdominal aneurysm. And of course, the measurements are, are uh, all isotropic and, and very precise in terms of being able to uh, give accurate measurements for uh, which size device or whether the, the, the arteries can handle the devices. Uh, we can also look at complications. As you know, uh, there are uh, access-related vascular injuries associated with TAVR. In the Partner 1 study, it was 11%. In the Partner 2, 8.5%. In the Core Valve study, 5.9%. This is just an example of a patient who actually had a uh, saccular aneurysm, a pseudoaneurysm, which was picked up on CT after delivery of the device. 
Uh, this is an example of a, how we look at the annulus. And um, I'm trying to see here. We don't have a keyboard, so I can get this to move, I guess. Is there not a mouse? Can, you, can someone click on the slide, please? Maybe. There is, there is. Where is it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, thank you so much. It, it really does help me. I, I have a lot of these. Okay, when we, when we, uh, we, we go perpendicular to the, to the annulus, and then we identify the annulus as shown here, and then we make our, our measurements. So you can see our measurements. These are minor and major axis perimeters. Uh, this is the minor axis, major axis is the perimeter. We can also do areas around the valve in, in terms of uh, sizing uh, the valves. And again, these are the different sizes that we, that we utilize. Now, this is important because uh, paravalvular regurgitation uh, is seen in, in these different trials. And if you undersize the valve, you'll, you'll get significant regurgitation as compared to uh, if you uh, oversize the valve to somewhere between 5 and 15%. And so when you do that, you get none or trivial uh, regurgitation. But again, if you undersize, you're going to get moderate to severe regurgitation. And um, that's an important issue because we know from the original partner data, when you look at paravalvular regurgitation, when you have mild to, uh, moder uh, mild to severe versus none, there's a, there's a difference in outcomes. And this is also true when you look at total aortic regurgitation. And uh, you can see what the, what the uh, rates of regurgitation were in terms of mild and moderate to severe. In the recent Partner 2 trial, you can see that moderate or severe regurgitation led to a, a very high event rate as compared to none or a mild. So it's important to be able to size these valves properly. And the way we do that with CT is to actually recognize that the annulus is eccentric. And so we, we recognize that it's, it's more of an oval rather than a circle. And uh, so we're able to give the perimeter, we're able to give the, the area, and we're able to therefore size the valve very nicely. This is a patient post tab where you can see uh, how nicely this now fits fully expanded. Uh, this is a patient who had an undersizing of the valve, and you can see severe uh, aortic regurgitation. So uh, this is, again, something that needs to be done, and sometimes just measuring the, uh, the annulus in terms of diameters is not adequate. You really need to have the, the area of the annulus and recognize its, its, uh, its, uh, its complexity in terms of its annular, uh, um, whether it's oval or whether it's round in shape. And if you look at these two trials uh, that have care, actually compared uh, CT data to, uh, to uh, uh, echo data, you can see when you look at the area under the curve in terms of uh, lack of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, paravalvular regurgitation that CT actually does, does quite well in both of these trials. And in fact, there was just a recent trial by Binder which looks at, looked at this in a prospective fashion where they actually had an algorithm that based on what kind of valve you used, uh, you would, you would, uh, you would um, ha need this kind of uh, annular area. So for the 20, the 23, the 26, and the 29, and they randomized patients giving these kind of algorithms or letting uh, physicians do what they wanted in terms of doing either, either uh, esophageal echo trans TEs or, or simply using CTs as they, as they wish based on, what they, uh, on, what they, on how, they, how they felt clinically the, the patient should get a, in terms of a valve. And what you'll see in this particular trial is that the primary endpoint was uh, more than mild paravalvular regurgitation. And you can see here that it was 5.3% only in those where the algorithm was used using CT as compared to 12.8%. So by using CT and by using specific algorithms in terms of how to size valves, you can clearly prevent a lot of the complications that, uh, that you see, like this paravalvular regurgitation. Another important issue is preventing aortic root injury. And uh, this particular study looked at that and basically found that uh, if you look at the, at the most likely reason to have uh, aortic root injury, it's in, it's in patients who have severe upper LVOT calcification, and particularly when it involves the non-coronary cusp. And in fact, in this particular study, you can see here's a patient with uh, severe calcification. You can see the calcification in the upper part of the LVOT. And this, this patient had a vascular injury. You can see this patient had calcification in the non-coronary cusp and extended downward. 
And this, of course, is the end result of a patient with a TAVR valve who developed a rupture of the, of the LVOT. So in this particular study, it was, it was shown that if you have upper LVOT calcification uh, that's severe below the non-carnary cusp, or if you oversize the valve and or oversize the valve greater than 20%, you're more likely to get uh, annular uh, rupture. So again, this is why CT is extremely helpful in terms of identifying uh, potentially uh, hotspots like this. We can also assess the aortic valve specifically, and this is an example of a patient with severe aortic stenosis, and I think you can see in systole and diastole. Uh, this is a tricuspid valve. This was a bicuspid valve. You can see the severe calcification, and of course, this is a, stand, a typical type of bicuspid uh, orientation. This patient also had severe stenosis. And uh, we can polynimeter those valves. So here's that valve, and here's the valve area. And so the valve area here actually turned out to be 0.5 centimeters squared. So we can get a very nice look at how severe the aortic stenosis is in these kind of patients. We can also assess uh, valves that are already implanted. And this is a picture of a bioprosthetic valve. And I think you can appreciate uh, what, how high the fidelity of these images are uh, in terms of looking at not only native valves, but also in terms of looking at uh, bioprosthetic valves uh, with CT. We can also ass assess aortic insufficiency. Uh, we look at that in diastole. We look for these gaps uh, in the leaflets as compared to the normal valve. So here you have a valve uh, which has, uh, has some mild aortic insufficiency. This is a normal valve here. Uh, we also look uh, at, the, at the aorta in terms of the size because there are some limitations uh, in terms of using the core valves depending on the size of the aorta, so in terms of grabbing the wall. This particular patient had a very large uh, aortic aneurysm. This patient also had severe AI, and you can see that the valve uh, area here in terms of the effective regurgitant orifice area was very, was very severe. We can also look at patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which also uh, becomes a contraindication for putting these valves in. And again, as I said, you can look at bicuspid valves, you can look at aortic aneurysms. Uh, and typically, what else we do in terms of looking at CT is we look at the coronary osteum. This is very important for the sapien valve in terms of looking at the height of where the coronaries come off from the uh, aortic annulus and also the angulation using with the core valve uh, with, the, with the perimeter. Now, another part of CT, which is really kind of nice, is that we do all of this to look at um, all the core valve issues, to do all the measurements. Well, we get the coronary arteries for free. As part of the exam, uh, this, this becomes a routine assessment. And we can get very nice pictures in terms of assessing all of the different main coronary arteries in terms of valve stenosis. Now, this is, this is important because uh, we now have a much improved temporal resolution. This is just an example of how you can freeze frame something by having a very fast shutter speed. And so if you don't have a fast shutter speed, like our old 64 slice scanners, you get blurred arteries like this. But when you have a fast shutter speed, you get very pristine, sharp images as shown here. This just shows you an example of uh, what our old scanner looked like in terms of how fast the gantry used to move. And look at our new scanners, how fast they move. And the, of course, the gantry speed, the, revela the revolution in one second is what determines the uh, temporal resolution. And so our new scanners have 64 mil uh, milliseconds of temporal resolution, which allows us to really freeze frame the heart. And of course, this becomes very important in TAVR situations because we don't beta block these patients because we're, we really, it's rather an unsafe thing to do. And so we can image these patients at heart rates of 80 and 90 and not worry about it. We get very good images. The other thing is it doesn't matter how irregular the heart rate is, even in atrial fibrillation. And this is a patient who had a heart rate between 54 and 139 where we do actually interval testing over the T wave which, doesn't vary, which really doesn't vary from the R wave very much. It's usually the, uh, the diastolic uh, areas that, that, uh, that, that vary greater with, with changing in heart rates. And you can see that even in someone like this, you get pristine images. This is a stent, and you can see that that is a very pat nice patent stent. So you can really get very, very nice images despite the fact that you have high heart rates or even very irregular heart rates. The other issue about uh, CT is that you can also see other things. 
uh, we see the non-cardiac issues, such as this patient who had a thyroid tumor that was just picked up incidentally on a, on a TAVR study, and uh, this patient who had a big lung abscess that was previously undiagnosed. And we've picked up multiple malignancies before in the, in the belly as well as in the chest. And uh, in fact, a lot of those, some of those patients have actually gone, they've gone for open thoracotomies of their, uh, of their lung tumors and then gone for other procedures after that. So, so uh, we pick up a lot of uh, abnormalities in these, in these rather elderly patients that, uh, that, that have a lot of chest abnormalities and, and also abdominal. So again, we can look at the aortic annulus very precisely. We can look at the aorta very precisely, the annulus very precisely. And even after the, 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 uh, uh, the valve is implanted, we can look at that also very precisely with CT. So we can do post uh, assessments as well as pre-assessments on these patients. So uh, in conclusion, CT really is a one-stop uh, shop for doing uh, TAVR procedures. You get complete vascular assessment when planning your TAVRs. You can evaluate aortic valve morphology, bicuspid valves, tricuspid valves, extent of vascular calcification, etc. You can get precise uh, determinations of the annulus and areas uh, uh, for choosing the proper valve uh, prosthesis. Uh, you can accurately assess the aortic root, uh, the location of the coronary ostea, whether there's any LVOT calcification, uh, which again could be important in terms of uh, having uh, uh, rupture, and uh, LV morphology and function. And uh, we can assess the coronary arteries in terms of uh, the severity disease and the location and identify any other non-cardiac issues that might preclude or postpone uh, TAVR uh, procedures. Thank you very much.